All right, kia ora. Uh, here is task two for uh, week five of remote learning. So today we are continuing on with the alkene work, uh, but we are starting to look at the chemical reactions that the alkenes do. Really, really important because now uh, we can start seeing more of that interrelationship of the organic function groups and how we can go from one to another. Um, basically really good to help you set up for the various types of organic chemistry questions. Cool. So with the success criteria, I've crossed out a lot of things because we are looking at specific types of reactions. Uh, the first one being the oxidation of the alkenes. Uh, we're also going to be looking at the alkenes in the context of elimination and addition reactions. Um, so do kind of keep that in mind. And like I said, I've crossed things out that we um, aren't covering in this lesson. Cool. So with the alkenes, lots of reactions that they can do. The first one is that how do we make the alkenes? So in order to make an alkene, we need to do an elimination reaction. And elimination reactions are just talking about removing something from the molecule to make a double bond. Remember, you're going from a saturated molecule to an unsaturated molecule by doing that. Um, the other thing is that the alkenes can do lots of reactions uh, from that. Um, so because it's unsaturated and we have a double bond there, we can break that double bond and add a lot of things to it, thus making it um, give you that possibility of a lot of different reactions. Alkenes are really important to understand because this is kind of like grand central station for organic molecules. Um, and it's also a great way to transfer from basically one type of organic molecule to another. So we're very often going to need to bypass our... We're very often going to need to make a pit stop at the alkenes when doing a conversion from one organic molecule to another. Um, it's also a great molecule if we want to shift things through the molecule and move something from uh, one carbon group to another. Um, but we'll see that in uh, specific NCA example questions. So the first thing with the alkenes is that they can undergo combustion. Very unlikely you're going to get a question on this, uh, but just keep in mind that alkenes, like the alkanes, can react with um, oxygen and burn, and when they do that, they form water and carbon dioxide. And if there's a limited amount of oxygen, then we get um, carbon monoxide, which is poisonous, or carbon, uh, which is also known as soot. Uh, these don't tend to burn as cleanly as the alkanes, so the alkanes are the preferred method um, of burning. There's more energy there, etc., etc. Cool. Now let's talk about the different types of addition reactions with the um, alkene. So basically, we're going from alkene to a um, saturated molecule. So the first type of example is the hydrogenation. Uh, in this case, the name hints to what you're doing. You're adding hydrogen. So with that, we're converting the alkene to an alkane. Uh, this reaction here will require a catalyst. Either you use uh, nickel that's been heated or you can use platinum at room temperature. Um, this is how we manage to take the unsaturated molecules like oils, uh, so plant-based oils that we know are liquid at room temperature, and they do this hydrogenation process to break the double bonds because we want it to be straight chain so they stack better and have more intermolecular bonds and thus um, a higher melting and boiling point. And so that's how we are able to convert plant-based oils into margarine and getting a solid state from that. Um, just some interesting things there. This is what we're looking at when it comes to that reaction. You're breaking the double bond, you're adding hydrogen to it. Uh, and that's the example of the margarine process. So we have obviously these double bonds and we want to remove some of these double bonds so that way it stacks better and more intermolecular bonds, forces form, and thus it's uh, a solid at room temperature. Cool. Next one then is the halogenation. And again, like I said, these names kind of hint to what's happening. In this case, we are adding halogens. Um, if I wanted to add bromine, that's really easy. It happens at room temperature. Um, and the thing to kind of note about this is that this is a very fast reaction and we don't need any catalyst for this to happen. So unlike with the alkanes and that substitution reaction, which needed UV light and it's slower, bromination um, of an alkene happens pretty instantaneously. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is because this is a good identification test. And don't worry, we will do identification tests as a separate lesson. I'm just trying to 
point it out early so that way you've heard it multiple times. It's really good for that long-term memory if you hear it multiple times. So anyway, if I had two solutions, an alkane and an alkene, they're both colorless, I won't be able to tell the difference. If I add uh, bromine water, which is brown, and I leave it at room temperature, the alkene will react and the alkane won't. I will need to expose the alkane to UV light and then it will react and do that substitution reaction. Whereas with the alkene, it's just an addition reaction, break the double bond, add it. Now, the moment we do that, it gets decolored because the bromine is now a halo alkane, which is colorless. Um, halogenation, when it comes to chlorine, does require UV light, uh, so it's not as, uh, so it needs an energy source unlike uh, the bromine. And this is what we're looking at for that reaction. So what happens here is the double bond breaks and a, a bromine will be added to each one of the carbon uh, molecules involved in that double bond. Really important to also remember that um, the bromine isn't getting attached to the same carbon, it's getting attached to each carbon because when that bond breaks, both of those carbons have a, an available spot, which is going to be filled with bromine. So thus the one, two, dibromo. Again, make sure that you are stating the dye and you're stating the location of each of the bromines. Cool, next one then is the oxidation of the alkenes. This, even though is even though it's referred to as oxidation, this is also another addition reaction. And for this to occur, we're going to need potassium permanganate. And again, we can use it as a um, observation test, an identification test, because if it is able, if it is an alkene, it will oxidize and we'll see a color change from purple uh, to colorless or purple to brown, depending on if the um, permanganate is acidified. If it's acidified, it's going to be colorless. If it's not, it'll be brown. What happens in this case is we break the double bond and again, each one of those um, carbons are going to get their own alcohol group. So we make a diol. Um, uh, again, we can uh, distinguish this from the alkanes because they cannot be oxidized by the potassium permanganate and so it will still have those two layers and because the alkane and the permanganate aren't soluble because permanganate is often in water uh, and it will stay purple. So again, another good distinguishing test. And we break this double bond here and each one of those carbons gets the alcohol. And so you would call it FN12-diol or 1,2-dihydroxyl-ethane. You can name alcohols two different ways, which we'll talk about in I think the next lesson. All right, cool. Now let's start getting to the more complicated addition reactions. Um, and these ones are a bit more complicated because you're not adding two of the same things. Um, so each carbon involved in the double bond aren't getting the exact same thing. So in hydrogenation, we saw both of them getting hydrogen. In halogenation, we saw them both getting halogens. In oxidation, we saw them both getting alcohols. In this case, we are going to have two different things that are going to add to it. The first one is the hydration reaction. And think about hydrating, you are adding water. Now, when this reaction occurs, you could get um, two things potentially being attached. So if you break up the water molecule, you have an OH, uh, which is your alcohol group, and you have hydrogen. Um, and depending on which carbon in the double bond has more of the hydrogens, that's going to decide what they then get. So this is referring to Makarnikov's rule. I'll explain it on this slide, and then I also have it printed out as an example problem somewhere. Yeah, so I can actually go through it a bit slower in more details. But basically what you're looking at are the carbons involved in the double bond. This one is the rich one because I can see it has two hydrogens. This one's the poor, it only has one. So with Makarnikov's rule, the rich get richer, and it's more likely that this here will gain another hydrogen, and then this will have to get the alcohol, which is known as Makarnikov's product or the major product. The opposite can occur. Sometimes we get a lucky break and they win the lottery, and the hydrogen gets added to the poor carbon, which is what happened in this case, and then the alcohol is now on the uh, first carbon instead. Sorry about that interruption. Someone just walked into my office. All right, cool. Let's keep going. 
Um, so also with the hydrogenation, uh, reagent wise, you're going to need um, concentrated sulfuric acid and you're going to need it um, heated as well. All right, another type of addition reaction where you have two potential products, uh, two different things being attached is the hydrohalogenation. And again, the name makes sense. You're doing hydrogen and you're doing the halogen. Um, so basically when that double bond breaks, we are looking to see who is going to get the hydrogen and who's going to get the halogen. Um, I believe I have this one printed out. I'm not really sure how my slides are ordered. <laughs> I need to fix it for next year. All right. So um, we have to use McCarnikoff's rule whenever we have an asymmetric alkene. If we have a symmetrical alkene, then it doesn't matter because when the bond breaks and I add the hydrogen to one and the bromine to the other, it doesn't matter which one gets added to which because you flip the, you flip the molecule around and you number it the other way and it's still the same uh, molecule. So for an asymmetric um, alkene, what you're looking for is um, different things attached to at least one of the carbons involved in the double bond. Um, and basically what occurs is that one's going to get the halogen, one's going to get the hydrogen, or one's going to get the alcohol, one's going to get the hydrogen. We then have two possible products, the major and the minor, uh, and thus we need to apply McCarnikoff's rule, which is stating that the carbon with the more hydrogens is more likely to gain another hydrogen thus being the major product um, and or you can remember this as the rich gets richer it's also important to remember that this only applies to the carbon involved in the double bond and how many hydrogens are attached to that carbon so if a carbon is attached to the carbon in, in the double bond and it has uh, three hydrogens attached to that carbon it doesn't count again i'll show you an example um, to explain what i mean Sorry, I think the notes were a little bit out of order, but that's okay. You guys did my Karnikoff's rule last year, so hopefully it's not a completely foreign concept. Where did my document camera go? I just dropped the paper on the ground. Close all window. Let's restart the program. Just gonna pause this. Oh, gotten it to work again. All right, so here are some of my examples. Um, so you can see McCarnikoff's rule in action in case my talking didn't make sense. Um, so what we are looking at with McCarnikoff's rule is I have an alkene here. One, two, three. And that is a pen, no, pro I don't need to specify where the double bond is because it can only be on carbon one and two. Um, this is also not symmetrical, so it does matter where the hydrogen and the bromine go. An example of a symmetrical, symmetrical one would be um, butuene. Because in the case of butuene, um, if I add the hydrogen here and the bromine here, I still have, uh, I have a two bromo. If I add the bromine here and the hydrogen there, I still have the two bromo, because it's one, two. So that's what I mean by symmetrical. In this case, it's not symmetrical, so it doesn't matter. When I look at this carbon here, carbon number one has two hydrogens. Carbon number two only has the one hydrogen. This, even though I have a methyl attached to carbon number two, none of these hydrogens count towards my rich, poor head count. So it's only hydrogens that are directly attached to the carbon involved. So carbon number one is the rich carbon, so it is more likely to gain another hydrogen, which is that one there, making it the major product, and then the bromine will be attached to carbon number two. Um, and so the major product is going to be the 2-bromo-propane. Uh, However, sometimes there's a lucky break 
and this poor little carbon gets the hydrogen and then the bromine has to be attached to carbon number one and so you get one bromo uh, propane as the minor product. It just means which one do you find in a greater quantity and the greater quantity is the major. Last year they had a specific question on this. This year you're not going to get a specific question on it. However, when you do your flow chart and conversion questions, you're going to need to specify um, which major or minor product you're taking for the next step in your process. Um, so that's why we do need to refresh it. In this bottom section here, there's a what if question and the what if question is what if both carbons involved in the double bond have the same number of hydrogens. So this carbon here has no hydrogens, so zero hydrogens. Uh, we'll just do a, a not. And same with this one, zero hydrogens. Uh, it's obviously not a symmetrical molecule because we see that this one has two methyls and that one has a, um, uh, a methyl and ethyl. Uh, I'll go through and name it because I think it's good practice. So it's one, two, three, four, five. So uh, pent two ene, and then we have the methyls on carbon number two and three, uh, two, three uh, dimethyl is the name of that. Uh, we don't need to specify if it's cis or trans because there is no cis trans. There's no geometric isomers in this case because both of those have um, the same uh, attachment to it. So if I was to break this double bond and add a bromine, it does matter um, because I can have it uh, attached to carbon number two or I can have it attached to carbon number three. So I do need to do the two products. But in this case, because both of these carbons have the same amount, uh, what you have is a 50-50 ratio. So half of them will be the 2-bromo, half of them will be the 3-bromo. Um, so you don't have a major or minor, they're just produced in equal quantities, but you still need to state that there are two products being formed. So do watch out for that. Cool. All right, I think we go back to the notes in the PowerPoint, yes. We've done the what if. All right. So the next thing then to think about, we have talked about how we um, um, what reactions the alkenes can do. Now I want to talk about how do we make the alkenes. And the way we make the alkenes is through these elimination reactions. In that process, I'm removing things, creating a double bond, thus making a saturated, uh, an unsaturated molecule. Uh, the other way you can think about this is that it's the reverse of the addition reactions. Um, and again, alkenes can, like a lot of molecules can undergo this elimination reaction to make an alkene. So like I was saying, it's a very central um, part of these reaction, um, part of the reaction flow chart. So first off is I have a halo alkane and what I can do with that halo alkane is I can remove the um, halo alkane, and when I remove the halo alkane, I'm also removing a hydrogen from that. Um, remember that the reagent you need for that is the KOH in alcohol. Uh, remember, if it's KOH in water, you just have a substitution reaction, and then a double bond is formed. My byproduct then is just um, the potassium with the halogen. Um, yeah, that's that reminder. Um, that's a very dark joke <laughs> that I forgot to change. Um, anyway, alcohols to the alkenes. Um, in this case, we're removing the um, an alcohol and the hydrogen. This is also known as a dehydration reaction. And in order for me to do that, I need concentrated sulfuric acid. Um, it basically removes the hydrogen and the alcohol and we get uh, water as the byproduct. Um, we call it a dehydration reaction because you're dehydrating the molecule. We also can call it a condensation reaction because you're producing water um, as the byproduct. Cool. This then leads into Zaitsev's rule, which is aka reverse Makarnikov's rule um, or anti Makarnikov's rule. In this instance, we are still counting the hydrogen numbers but the one with the fewer number of hydrogens is more likely to lose another one. 
Um, so this is going to be, again, we're looking for things that are not symmetrical because if it's symmetrical, you still get the same product. Um, and alcohols or haloalkanes is what we're looking at. Um, so let's look at some examples, nice and slow with the document camera so you can see it. All right. And again, let me just talk about the symmetry. So if I had, for example, one, two, three, four, five, and the halo alkane was here, like that. So if I remove this halo alkane, and then I remove either this hydrogen or that hydrogen, I'm still getting the same molecule formed because the double bond uh, regardless of which hydrogen is taken off, is going to be in carbon two. So either one, two, and the double bond goes here, or one, two, carbon goes there. So either way, it's the same molecule. So we need something that's unsymmetrical. So here is my halo alkane. I can select either from taking the one on the right or the one on the left. The one on the right has three hydrogens, one, two, three. The one on the left only has two hydrogens, one, two. And so we are more likely to form the double bond uh, between carbon uh, two and three right here because this is more likely to lose that hydrogen. So the major is going to be one, two, three, four, uh, but uh, twoene. However, the other does occur. And in this case, if we remove the hydrogen from carbon number one and you form the double bond here, your minor is going to be but one in so the carbon bond forms or the double bond forms between one and two um, again they used to ask this as a specific question last year uh, now you just need to know it because when you're doing your conversions you might need to state oh next step we need to use the major product or we need to use the minor product uh, here's another example in this case we are still looking at halogens and we're using that concentrated uh, koh in um, alcohol this one is a little bit more drawn out, so it's a little bit harder, but there's our bromine. So it can either select it from carbon number one with three hydrogens, or it can select it from carbon number two, which only has the one hydrogen. Uh, so in this case, uh, what we see is the major product because the double bonds form between carbon uh, two and three. Whereas in this case, it's formed between carbon number one and two because it's losing the hydrogen from the rich carbon so that's my minor product cool hopefully that makes sense um not sure why the methyl number changed the methyl number changed i think because of the numbering what was that one two three four One, two, three, four. Yeah. So the reason why the methyl we see is on carbon three versus carbon two has to do with the numbering pattern. And you're numbering it so that way the uh, double bond's on the lowest number possible. So in this case, you have to number it one, two, because you want to use the one number. Whereas in this case, you're doing it one, two on this way. So that way, two is a long, uh, shorter, uh, smaller number. Uh, you could number it the other way, but the problem is then your methyl's on carbon number three, which is not the lowest number you can give it. Just watch out for those little things. All right, cool. I think that's everything for this lesson. Before I uh, summarize and move on, I just want to look at the giant flow chart again, just to kind of look at what we were talking about so far. So really big focus on the alkenes today. We talked about elimination reactions uh, and using uh, Zaytis rule to do that. But the other thing we need to keep in mind for the alkenes is that we also have the addition reactions. Um, so I'm gonna write addition here, so that way we can see it. Uh, in that case, lots of different ways you can do those additions. You can use the um, halogen, or you can use um, the hydrogen um, halide. Um, to get to the halo alkane. The other thing is we have the um, elimination going this way. Um, so let me just get the colors. So if I go from an alcohol to an alkene, again, we have another elimination reaction. And the reagent you're going to need is 
concentrated uh, sulfuric acid with heat to pull that water molecule out and dehydrate it. Uh, if I'm going in reverse from the alkene to the alcohol, then that is again another addition reaction. And I need to just double check real quickly what you need for that reaction. Hold on, let me just make sure I got it right. Concentrated. I don't think they both. I think this is just acidified water. I think I might have had a typo on here. No, I just think you need acidified water. I think I might have the wrong reagent there. Double check that. Cool, so that one's going this way. That one's going that way. I'm gonna start color highlighting. So that way you can see how everything interrelates um, because you're gonna to need to be able to go from one side to another. Cool. Oh, and then this one here is our oxidation. Let me just grab another color. Oxidation. We need permanganate. I'm making that dial. This is also a, another addition reaction. It's a little stealthy addition reaction. Cool. All right, I think that's everything, and I'm pretty sure I'm right about that because they can't both be the same reagent. <laughs> I remember thinking it's quite unusual that it's the same thing as acid, but in one case it's concentrated, in one case it's dilute. So I'm pretty sure that is the right way around now that I think of it. All right, cool. So there's the big picture of what we've learned so far. And like I said, those alkanes are very good uh, as a kind of grand stencil station to kind of get everyone moving around. Same with the halalkanes and the alcohols. Uh, and when we start doing those conversion questions, uh, you'll know how to integrate that in. Cool. All right, so go to the end. All right. Goodbye, great work today. Um, so you should know all the reactions with the alkenes and you should also start thinking about how we're gonna do that interconversion. Uh, for that success criteria, you should know the oxidation reactions with the alkene and um, some of the elimination reactions and all of the addition reactions. Cool, actually. No, I think we actually did that one too. Yes, we did both. My mistake. You have covered this one as well. We did all of them. Just fix it on there too. We have done dehydration. All right. Cool. So that's the end of today's lesson. Uh, you can move on to your Mahi choice. Remember that is listed on my Google site um, and all the resources are on Google Classroom.